everybody, and uh, thanks for joining this um, grand round. We have the, the privilege of having Dr. Eugene Richardson, who is a medical doctor and also an uh, anthropologist. He got his MD from Cornell and his uh, PhD in anthropology uh, at Stanford. And he has been working intensively on Ebola in West Africa before and now has been uh, commissioned by CDC to help with uh, COVID work. He has written a book on um, global health and uh, decolonizing global health. And um, I think this is a critical topic and uh, a very current one. And I hope uh, this will lead us to a, a nice uh, discussion about what uh, Dr. Richardson has to say. Jean, you have the floor. All right, thanks so much. It's an honor to join you guys today. I really appreciate your uh, logging on and to discuss a bit about the, the book I put out, but more uh, to you know, um, see its implications for discussion with uh, experts in, uh, in global health, uh, like the community here. So I'll just get right into it. Okay. So the uh, book is called Epidemic Illusions on the Coloniality of Global Public Health. And here's one of the figures, although it's not in motion from the book. Um, and this kind of sums it up. Uh, this is it in a, in a nutshell. Whereas um, you know, Global North institutions, elite universities like Harvard um, claim to um, have, a, you know, to be pursuing Veritas, uh, which is, you know, truth. Um, I think there, it's more that they develop a monopoly on truth through the, um, through the way that they, uh, you know, produce knowledge, the way that they sanctify it, um, and all these things I'm going to go through in the talk about how uh, one particular discipline, uh, epidemiology, um, uh, does it. And my, my critiques are go across the board for the social sciences. So economics, uh, anthropology, sociology, political science, to me, they would all um, uh, fall under the same critique. It's just that I've worked in the realm of global health for the past 20 years. And so that's where I've done my participant observation and I'm, I'm kind of fluent with the languages of it. And so, you know, my tribe is not, uh, uh, you know, a, a native group in Brazil, it's actually uh, the global health practitioners. Um, so I have no financial relationship with commercial entities to disclose. Uh, quick shout out to people in the department. So here's Dan who couldn't log on today, he said he'll watch it later. This is uh, him and I in Sierra Leone during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. And then here's Byler Barry who is a PhD student at UCSF right now, and we're at a, um, working on an Ebola sero, sero survey uh, near this rural beach. So here's the book, Epidemic Illusions. Um, the, the cover comes from um, a play on Plato's cave. So basically, you know, Plato's cave says that there's one of these caves and, and there's an outside and someone, the people are shown images and they're chained here and they're looking at these shadows on the wall. And this is all they believe is reality. And then someone sneaks out and gets into the sun and sees what's really going on and comes back and tells them, hey, you haven't been looking at truth. Truth is out in, uh, out in the, you know, outside the cave. My take is that there, when you're talking about human behavior, and so I'm not, I'm not, critiquing, uh, you know, three quarks make a proton or cancer causes, or tobacco causes cancer or masks prevent transmission. I'm critiquing any social inquiry that involves human behavior because there's always a way, there's always ways of, um, of shoehorning in ideology when, when human behavior is being studied. And so 
uh, in the realm of social science, or I'll just call it social inquiry from now on because I don't really see it as a science and that's not a bad thing. Um, then we have a, a situation more like this, which I'm calling a warning. But there's actually pluriversal ways of describing the world from you know, what we call social science to dream time in the Aboriginal lands to you know, folk history. There's all, there, there are many different ways of describing the phenomena around us. Um, and some are more just than others. Um, and this is, uh, this is basically a pragmatic notion of truth, right? That truth is what we come to agree upon, not what we find outside, outside us in, in the form of a capital T truth. So if it's true that there are many ways of representing the world, then there is no outside that we can get to. There's just many different boroughs we can visit. Um, and why would we visit different boroughs? One of the chapters basically redoes the platonic dialogue of the cave with uh, Socrates and it exchanges him for uh, Kwame Nkrumah and, um, and Charles Peirce, who is the father of American pragmatism, and does the dialogue over and what it might look like uh, a pluriversal conception of knowledge and not a like, Western universal conception. So also start out with my positionality. I watched uh, Madhu Pai's uh, talk last year, um, and he did a great job of, you know, talking about the nuts and bolts of of, of uh, global public health. How practically, you know, through the the people who are co-authors to the people that are uh, editors to the where the funding comes from, all the actual, um, you know, praxis of global health, how that needs to be de decolonized. Um, my aim is actually to look more epistemologically, like how. Um, how uh, you know things like racism, structural violence are actually built into what we call social science. That um, you know, public health science is not a objectively neutral way of viewing the world. It's an ideologically influenced way of parsing health phenomena, and it's a way of curating facts in a way that um, you curate them this way. One ideology is promoted. You curate them this way. Another ideology is promoted. And I don't think there's ever getting getting away from the ideology you promote. There's just getting more just, um, and we'll get to that. And so my aim, unlike Madhu, who is actually, you know, grew up working in a global health setting and now is a, a professor in Canada, um, is not to represent the majority world's experience of epistemic violence, but rather to struggle with global health theory and praxis and to kind of show a black mirror to it. Um, to and this is from Hamlet, uh, to show um, how the harmers do their harm. Because I've you know, worked for the World Bank and the WHO and MSF and Partners in Health and Harvard. And so I've, I've seen how global elites um, do their harm, um, to, to put it short. So um, what we're talking about concerns, you know, th these are moral debates on the global North's obligation to the destitute sick. And a lot of these debates take for granted that um, as potential helpers, we're morally related to the starving abroad um, as potential helpers. Like to me, this is the crux of it right here. Public health si science sees itself as, pub as potential helpers, but it ignores um, that uh, you know, we are significantly morally related to the destitute sick um, as supporters of and beneficiaries of a global health, of a global institutional order that contributes to their destitution. So it's not just this, you know, things came to be and this is how the global south evolved and this is how we evolved and we happen to get a, uh, a better place and now we need to use that better place to help. It's that we actually continue to benefit from an institutional order that our, our sciences rarely uh, deconstruct. And by not deconstructing them, we actually contributing to them. And to me, that is what is called uh, symbolic violence. And we'll get to that. So the book is about coloniality. So I'll define that really quickly. Uh, coloniality can be described as the matrix of power relations that persistently manifest despite a former colony's achievement of nationhood. Uh, the framework attempts to capture racial, political, economic, social, epistemological, linguistic, engendered hierarchical orders imposed by Euro colonialism that transcended decolonization or uh, independence movements, and they continue to oppress uh, with the needs of pan-capital. Uh, pan 
The heterogeneous and multiple global structures put in place over a period of 450 years did not evaporate with juridical political decolonization of the periphery or independence, political independence over the past 50 years. We continue to live under the same colonial power matrix. With juridical political decolonization, we move from a period of global colonialism to the current period of global coloniality. And lastly, despite the celebration of decolonization as a milestone in African history, Africa has not managed to free itself from epistemological colonization. This is my, my whole point, that inscribed on the continent by missions, secular schools, schools of public health, medical schools, Western universities, religious dominations, other institutions, they, these carry Western cultural imperialism, usually unwittingly. And well, we'll try to look at some examples of that. Uh, and in, in the end, what I think is really colonized these days is people's perception. So colonialism imposed its control of the social production of wealth through military conquest and subsequent political dictatorship. But its most important area of domination was the mental universe of the colonized, the control through culture of how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. Um, so I have a, um, uh, there's a, it's a, I have a paper out, it's also a chapter in the book, um, and I won't discuss it today, but it's essentially about when I was in Congo, uh, a group of Harvard public health researchers came and studied um, misinformation and, um, and conspiracy theories and basically wrote a paper that got into Lancet ID saying that um, transmission there was fueled, you know, people had their suffering to blame on their belief in in Ebola conspiracy theories. And to me, that is a way of controlling the way they perceive the world. They're basically saying, you know, you have your own, you have your own um, lack of knowledge to, uh, to blame for your suffering. You know, you don't have, you don't have Leopold, King Leopold, uh, the Belgian colonization to blame for any of it. Um, and, and so to me, the, you know, the, when these journals structure uh, you know, this, this type of uh, research structures the way people talk about the outbreak. Like I was there, you know, once this came out, you heard more Ministry of Health people and WHO people saying, oh gosh, they're conspiracy theories. Like they only have themselves to blame. No one was talking about, uh, you know, legacies of colonialism. I go to WHO meetings and say, you know, I think the best way to fix this outbreak would be reparations from Belgium and get laughed out of the room. And we'll get to why I think that that is a response, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, set the table for um, what I mean by, um, you know, social science, um, in particular epidemiology commits symbolic violence because it colonizes people's perception and, and doesn't, it really guts um, seeing things uh, more upstream and, and therefore radical interventions are discounted. So similar, one way to think of it is like what um, what social media does. So this movie, the documentary on um, Netflix called The Social Dilemma, it's about how Facebook and Twitter and all that, um, you know, the product, th those companies, the, the product is your attention. And so their goal is um, slight imperceptible change in your behavior, in your perception, and then your behavior. That's, that's how they work. And I'll, I'll go so far to say is that's how our social sciences work. They actually, um, they shape people's perception of the world and have them act usually according to dominant, dominant interests. So another term, cultural hegemony. Um, so continuing the argument, if exploitive socioeconomic relations are foundational to the so social order, which they are in our country, uh, then this is likely to have a fundamental shaping effect on social ideation. So I think because, you know, racism um, exploitative socioeconomic relations are so foundational to our order that it, it, it's going to, it finds its way into the literature. It finds its way into the, um, it, into our social science, our social inquiry, it finds its way into our uh, media and movies and all of that. And what it leads to in social inquiry is what I'm calling bourgeois empiricism. And uh, Levins and Lawanton have, uh, went on record saying that, uh, you know, models of disease causation that obscure socio-historical forces, right? They're not just value neutral and trying to tackle the question from a downstream uh, um, angle. They are actually political acts. 
They give support to social structures that hide behind scientific objectivity to perpetuate dependency, exploitation, racism, elitism, and colonialism. And then I, I talked about some violence, er, symbolic violence earlier. It can be, be thought of as the capacity to impose the means for comprehending and adapting to the social world by representing the economic and political world in disguise taken for granted forms. And so here's a paper that Byler and Dan and I worked on in, um, uh, with Ebola survivors in uh, Sierra Leone. But with the Congo example, um, you know, I, I think that the, my Harvard co colleagues basically presented a way of understanding the social world that, you know, um, did this right here. It, it obscured Leopold, it obscured U US imperialism, and it therefore was a political act that, um, that gutted um, calls for those uh, ways of repairing the current situation, and, and we'll get to that also. So epidemiology as dispositif, um, kind of the Foucauldian word for apparatus. I prefer Agamben's uh, extension of it, and he said that you know, further expanding already large class of Foucauldian apparatus, I shall call a dispositif or apparatus literally anything that has in some way the capacity to capture, orient, determine, intercept, model, control, or secure the gestures, behaviors, opinions, or discourses of living beings. And I think these four paradigms of epidemiology, um, causal inference, big data, regression models, and epidemic modeling, all find ways of kind of capturing behavior, then determining people's understanding of health phenomena, securing how they respond to it. Um, and in the book, I go through all four. Today, I'm just going to focus on the last one, epidemic, epidemic modeling. But for causal inference, I've been really influenced by this social science and medicine article from uh, 2016 by Sharon Swartz and colleagues. If you haven't read it, I, I think it's fantastic. Is the well-defined intervention assumption politically conservative? I actually agree that it is. I don't think there's, and this is why I'm wary of causal inference becoming a dominant paradigm for epidemiology, because there's no way of using it for real kind of structural work. You're never going to show that cutting off a great, 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 great grandparent's hand led to higher risk for um, somebody down the line in, in uh, for Ebola in Congo. And so you're left with doing these very downstream analyses. And I, um, I critique a paper about um, HIV and um, household food security in the book, um, about what you know what this looks like taken to its sort of uh, you know like reduced to absurdity. Uh, big data. I also have a chapter on um, regression models. The regression models one is is easy. You know you can take papers like I did with um, uh, Aram Ben David down at Stanford has done some of these papers that basically show that. You know, all this money coming from USAID was, um, you know, improving uh, under five mortality across the board in Africa countries. So like this, so aid is a successful, um, uh, you know, political mechanism for improving lives and improving relations between countries. All you had to do was like add a single variable. Um, in, in the case of the, the paper I'm talking about, I put in illicit financial flows, which are um, the money that's, so if you look at Africa in 2017, um, $140 billion came in in the form of aid and remittances and 200 billion came out in illegal flows, not just repatriation of profits. So um, tax mi mix invoicing, uh, tax uh, evasion and resource theft. And so the whole idea of development is a total farce. Like the continent of, of Africa has developed the global north to the tune of 40, 50 billion dollars a year. So the fact there's even a USAID is like a, a semiotic falsehood. Um, and so I basically, yeah, you know, showed in one regression model, just sub substituting that one variable showed that any country that got um, USAID money, those, those gains were completely offset by losses uh, in illicit financial flows. So I think it's pretty, it's pretty easy in, in regression modeling uh, because you can't get rid of, uh, you can never get all the confounders to, to just choose your variables and come up with uh, something that supports your ideological position. And the guys at Stanford clearly have a conservative position as they've shown with their that, uh, Santa Clara study. Um, and it's a separate story. So 
I'm going to talk about uh, epidemic modeling and uh, a paper I'm writing more for a general audience is called uh, Using the Instruments of Epidemiology. By instruments, I actually mean the people. Um, and so Foucault in an interview with uh, Deleuze said, the role of the intellectual is no longer to sit situate himself slightly ahead or slightly to one side in order to speak the silent truth of, uh, to each and all. It's rather to struggle against those forms of power where he is both an object and an instrument. And I don't think any of the social sciences, sciences really do this, that struggle with how they are an instrument of power. Um, and then here's something from Ruha Benjamin, that uh, human tool making is not limited to stone instruments of our early ancestors. With the sleek gadgets produced by modern tech, uh, cultures also create symbolic devices that structure society. And I'm really involved in, uh, really interested in uh, symbolic power. Right. So on the left, we have uh, Leo Tolstoy. And on the right, we have Nietzsche. And I start out the paper with them because, uh, you know, Tol Tolstoy has a theory of humanity where, you know, there's no such thing as movers and shakers, as, as like geniuses that uh, dictate how people uh, act around them. There is only a collective will that is just filled by a person. So, um, you know, Na Napoleon wasn't an uber human like Nietzsche would have thought. Uh, Napoleon just re represented a collective French ambition for the revolution and then for uh, uh, for empire across Europe. You know, they're basically sanctioned the conquest of fellow Europeans. Um, same thing with Trump. Trump's no, you know, demagogic genius. He's actually just filling the role of a very racist society and, and allowing that to, to perpetuate itself. Um, and so I'd say the same thing with, um, with anybody that finds themselves in positions of authority, uh, whether it's Fauci um, or uh, Chris Murray from, uh, from the IHME. Um, these guys are not, they're not really, um, you know, helping our country out with their genius. They're, they're filling roles that have been, uh, that, that represent collective will. And both, in both cases, I think that that collective will is racism. So for Tony, you can look at the things he said about, uh, you know, black people dying from um, COVID, uh, you know, having a much higher mortality because of comorbidities and all of that, which is pretty, it, it is a racist analysis, right? You know, the structural analysts um, before any data even came out said, there's no way it's black fragility that's causing this. It's gotta be exposure risk. And now the data is coming out and showing that, yes, it is exposure risk, that there are actually structural determinants of why Black people get infected more often, and that's why it looks like they're dying more often. And so to perpetuate something about their lifestyle choices actually continues um, um, sort of racist stereotypes. Um, as far as the Gates Foundation, it sounds like um, since Dr. Sepulveda has, um, you know, was a senior member there, uh, we can talk about this afterwards. You know, there's a good article in The Nation about, um, you know, whether the billions or 600 million that he's, that Gates has donated to IHME is distorting public health data. Um, I'm just going to take the example of the COVID modeling to say that it has done very uh, strong ideological and racist work. Um, and so this paper here, which serves as the afterword of the book, um, I come to the conclusion that mathematical models of infectious disease transmission are merely fables dressed in formal language that therefore create the illusion of being scientific. And for the most part, they, the models serve not as forecasts, but as means of setting knowledge confines, like epistemic confines to the understanding of why some groups live sicker lives than others, confines that sustain predatory accumulation rather than challenge it. So here's the IHME uh, forecasts. Um, March and uh, et al. showed that the true number of next day deaths um, fell outside their 95% prediction intervals 70% of the time. So they were completely wrong <laughs> early on. Um, and we'll get to, yeah, Nassim. Um, their plunging projections were also used to endorse Trump administration's COVID response as competent and effective. So they served ideological purposes. So that's another danger of them where you can just pick and choose any of the models you want. Um, for those of you ha that haven't seen it, uh, Nassim Talib, he, he and um, John Yanidis had a, like, go a back and forth on a forecasting website about, you know, Yanidis's position was just, 
we need more data. We can't ruin the economy and shut down things uh, because we need more data to do better modeling. And Talib basically said that modeling is always useless because uh, it deals with point forecasts and, uh, for fat tailed variables. And that if you don't take the most um, paranoid route up front, then you're going to lose lives and spend resources uh, on useless modeling that you could have spent on actually um, uh, you know, containing the outbreak uh, early on. Um, to me, it's, uh, I don't see, you know, the, the modeling thing to me is like, um, I've actually, you know, worked in outbreaks for many years and I've never once used any modeling uh, for containment efforts. Um, and so the, my main problem with the IHME forecasts is that they endorse a future where COVID-19 disparities continue to exist. Institutionalized ra racism is rampant, hyper-incarceration is ongoing, and universal health co coverage is denied. So they actively delimit through their exaggerated precision and acceptance of government inventions of status quo, like looking like science, the public's ability to imagine social alternatives. You know, they'll say, okay, we'll have 3 million infections if you don't wear masks and you don't do this, or we'll have 1 million if you don't, if you wear the masks and, and um, socially distance. They never talk about anything, but there'll still be three times the number of, of deaths in black people. Um, and so, both forecasts continue this status quo imaginary. And to me, it might not seem like a lot, but I think that is where, that is how uh, collective racism is propagated. When it gets into even the, the academic institutions, which we think are neutral and objective, and they just perpetuate status quo ways um, of seeing the world. And so what would imagining social alter alternatives look like? So I'm chair of the Atlanta Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. Um, reparations can be thought of as acknowledgement of a grievous injustice, redress for the injustice, and closure of the grievance held by the group subjected to the uh, injustice. And uh, part of the people in that group to, to uh, see what modeling, uh, what anti-racist modeling might look like, put together this paper, um, Reparations for Black American Descendants of Persons Enslaved in the U.S. and Their Estimated Impact on SARS-CoV-2 Transmission. Um, and it's currently in a revise and resubmit at social science and medicine, but I'll tell you that it got denied at 10 places before there, before going to social science and medicine. And most of us on it are, the, the comments we got were amazing. They weren't that your, your background, your buttressing, your models are, are great. They were that your assumptions seem too outlandish. Like the assumption that if we eradicated the wealth gap in the U.S., that black people could actually have housing um, that allowed them to uh, self-isolate like their white counterparts do, or that they would be involved in frontline work less. I mean, to me, it to us, it was really amazing such that we're writing a separate paper on how just kind of built into the peer review, we saw racism because it wasn't about the quality of the work. It was about the imaginary, like what, what is it? You know, we, we imagine too far of an assumption to in include. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what the models look like. Uh, well, they're not really models, but uh, so the background was in the United States, Black Americans are suffering significant disproportionate incidents of uh, COVID. And going beyond mere epidemiological tallying, the potential for racial justice interventions, including reparations payments, to ameliorate these disparities has not been adequately explored. Um, and what we start with is that models need to make assumptions about how people interact with others, but they rarely account for social forces like institutional and cultural racism, because it's hard to get them well-defined, right? Um, uh, that structure such interactions. Therefore, they can obfuscate such forces in their attempts to describe outbreak transmission dynamics. So what we did is um, we took Louisiana, which is a state with um, a, um, a large black population that's segregated and a white population and not many other minority groups so that we could just compare the two. We considered a range of reproductive uh, ratios to back calculate transmission rates for four cells of a simplified next generation matrix um, from which, so, you know, the simplified next generation matrix can be used to calculate R naught when you uh, get the, basically the di dominant eigenvalue. Um, and we, we looked at what monetary uh, payments as reparations might look like on uh, these transmission rates and, and subsequently are not. 
So here's the little the little matrix. You know, um, we basically have you know transmission between black people, transmission between white people, and and the dominant eigenvalue can be used to calculate R. In a situation like this, it's usually the highest risk group, so little mini R not, if you want to think of it that way, that comes to dominate and and determine this number. So, you know, if we basically used um, for examples to uh, populate these numbers, a place like, uh, you know, more egalitarian places like South Korea to show what we think the actual transmission in the white to white group is. Um, and then figure that the uh, black ratio is maybe four to five times that. And if that's the case, which you'll see in our results, you know, you'll get an R naught, uh, which we calculated for Louisiana up in the, in the fours. Um, so, uh, so beta is the transmission rate, uh, pi is the population proportion, gamma is a recovery rate that we did with, uh, uh, or sorry, yeah, with the gamma distribution. And then beta is determined by contact rate and transmissibility. So for contact rate, we were able to show through census records that um, Louisiana is overcrowded by race. Um, this means people living more than one to a room. Um, and so reasoning through the consequences of increased equity via matrix transmission models, we showed how um, a reparations program could, rele could redu have reduced the population R naught by 68%. And this is how we figured. So if you know, the, the transmission rate uh, for the black group is four to five times higher, we're up in an R naught of four. If through reparations you're able to achieve parity of transmission, and that's mainly through, we're show, you know, it's the properties of mathematical models show that it's mostly the contact and uh, intra-group contact. Um, that if we could achieve near parity, you don't even have to get to parity. You know, say it's still 1.5 times what transmission is in whites. You get the group R not down to a little over two. So. Um, so a restit restitutive program targeted towards Black not only decreases COVID risk for recipients, but the mitigating effects are distributed across racial groups, benefiting the population at large. And the mechanisms would be by narrowing the path-dependent racial wealth divide, changes in the built environment, fostering the ability to social distance. I think that one's key. Front Frontline work would be spread out across racial groups and then a de decreased race-based allostatic load. Since reparations have not been enacted, though, our reopening of American society has had a disproportionate adverse incidence on Black people. This was predictable and could even be thought of by some as like a modern Tuskegee. Uh, I mean, this is what I, when I look at the IHME models, I see Tuskegee. I see somebody that whose job it is to, to like they say on the website, improve the health of populations. And instead, they're improving the health of pop, you know, aiming to improve the health of populations while letting the status quo disparities remain. Um, and to me, if you're aware of that, then you've done, you've committed symbolic violence, and um, and and it's essentially racist work. Um, so the appalling evidence of racism embodied as COVID nineteen incidents should add to moral, historical, and legal arguments uh, for reparations. And so essentially, the book is uh, I try to trace. Uh, human rights failings to the impoverished discursive infrastructure of objectivist epidemiology. And again, you can do it for any social science. They all do, they all do the same thing. Um, we can transform global health by transforming its representations. So with that, hopefully we have time for discussion and feel free to email me on the side if there's uh, any questions about uh, or disputes. Uh, stop share. Um, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, that is certainly a provocative talk and uh, some of your positions might be debatable to say the least. And uh, for the record, I happen to disagree with several of your statements, but I think uh, that is the spirit that we okay. want to have in, in this uh, grand rounds. And um, I look forward to um, receiving uh, questions from, from the audience. Um, my 
uh, colleague uh, Jane Fieldhouse and uh, Kemi Amin uh, will be helping me manage some of the questions coming from the audience. I might have um, a comment uh, later on about the Gates Foundation and IHME and some of the adjectives uh, used uh, against them, uh, but I, that's part of the debate. Um, Jane, would you care to take uh, some of the questions that are already arriving to the Q&A, please? Yes, I would be happy to. And thank you so much, Dr. Richardson, for being here today. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat, um, but I wanted to begin um, with one for you um, about your work um, with partners in health. Um, and so uh, an attendee has asked, um, how is partners in health guilty or not um, in exactly the colonial approach um, to global health that you have talked about today? Great, great question, right? Because if you take some of my stuff to its logical conclusion, then you would say, all right, well, why, why even bother with, um, you know, NGO aid world and you should just be full on uh, doing reparation work. And so I think my, my response to that is, well, I'm still a clinician. And so that my skill set is, is not, um, you know, one of organizing, um, it's, it's seeing patients. And so I still think there, there, there is an amount of moder of um, sort of humanitarian work that can be done while the changes are taking place to greater global health uh, equity. Um, and so I, I agree that it, you know when I talk to the people at, at Partners in Health, I say you know you should you should call yourselves you know they they consider themselves a social justice organization. I and I say that, you know, if you consider yourself a transitional justice organization, like I think that might make the, more the point that this is, should be just a small transitional uh, um, piece of aid that really leads to a full-on movement of, uh, you know, uh, reparations movements around the world. Because I agree, all the, every team that I work with on this commission all say the same thing. There is no way we'll get to kind of this post-race world without repair of the previous legacies. So, you know, I kind of work on symbolic reparations. Like how does our knowledge production actually gonna get into people's heads that most everything we do is done um, uh, in some, uh, has been built on extraction from, you know, these places and continued extraction. Um, and then, but until that, you know, equity you know, reparations is achieved, I still think there is work to be done. And that's why I think Partners in Health is the best of the lot. I've worked with you know, a bunch of different NGOs um, and that's why I've thrown my hat in with them, but I agree. It's, it's, it's a very thin wire between just continuing aid industry and just trying to, trying to find better, you know, okay, MSF is better and PIH is better, let's just keep funding them. And thinking of them as very small nodes as transitional justice into more uh, redis redis redistributive and reparative justice. Fantastic, thank you for that take on uh, Partners in Health. And I wanted to follow up with another question um, pertaining a little bit more so to uh, perhaps academic institutions, um, since a large portion of the audience here today are students. Um, and just thinking about um, some practical tips uh, for students or those of us who are early on in our career as researchers um, and what we might do to uh, avoid perpetuating sort of these um, centuries of systemic injustices um, yeah. as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way question. And it's, it's very difficult because if I'm talking about there's some sort of, you know, collective will systematic setup that, um, you know, prevents people from even thinking about these radical interventions. It's also built into um, career path and funding. I'm never gonna get uh, funding to like do or uh, how, you know, we, we try to do this, like get how um, land reform. So how taking, um, you know, getting back all the land from white people in South Africa um, and redistributing among black citizens would be an intervention in HIV incidents, like among uh, other things. 
and you know people you will you'd never get a, um, a grant through it. Uh, and so it's hard because built into um, the sort of career trajectory it is um, you know keeping you at arm's length if you want to do this this radical stuff. Um, and so. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a good answer to it, just that, you know, the the funding me mechanisms need to be decolonized just as much as, and I don't even like saying decolonized because it's sort of a, a weird verb to use for it, a weird position to, to start from. But people have to recognize that, like a lot of, I have to put it this way, a lot of people better than me um, have not gotten an academic position because they were too focused on the good, like organizing work or uh, you know the work uh, in um, in actually doing practical work on the ground, and so you know I struggle with trying to go between the ivory, ivory tower and and work in the field, and and you know I you know I've told you what I've come up against getting laughed at at WHO meetings for bringing up um, uh, uh, you know the idea of reparations. Uh, maybe you know our commission will sort of uh, change the discussion a little, but. Um, you know, I think my whole point is that it's, it's in, it's built into what we're learning. It's not just, you know, okay, we can make people first author and set, uh, senior author more and, and have more African led groups and all these things. It's, like, it's actually built in to the, uh, the, the way we present and curate data, um, um, and so that, and that's what the book's about. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to explain it in a like logical argument fashion, and that's why the book is very experimental. It doesn't it doesn't take you through arguments. It's very just kind of um, strange heuristics to try and you know jog this way of seeing the world, you know, jog people out of the the, the mold that uh, many of us grew up in. Thank you. Um, and then I did also want to ask you, um, out of fear of, of interpreting this question my, myself, I will read it directly, uh, but with regard to epidemic models, um, is it really epidemic models per se um, that are colonial, racist, or problematic, um, or is it such that their use is because they are, in short, just uh, mathematical equations? Right. Um, and so, um, is it more so IHME and Bill Gates um, and how they produce this information that's problematic? Um, but can we use some of those mathematical modeling to estimate the impact of, for instance, um, reparations? Yeah, well, that's a great question too. I think, uh, I mean, yes to the way I've already stated, and it sounds like we'll, we'll have the discussion later that I think the way um, that IHME does work is extremely colonialist and, and racist. For example, to tell, you know, you take another Lancet paper of theirs that, you know, global, the global burden of disease, uh, the biggest killers of, uh, you know, people in global south are tobacco, diabetes, and, and uh, something else. It's like, if you, you leave from that thinking that, um, that it's these super downstream uh, uh, determinants of, of why people are dying, uh, then you've completely autoclaved imperialism's backstory. Um, and the, I'm, I'm not a good modeler, so I, I don't know. My sense though is that like, if you look at what we did, um, I think that's not been accepted because of just the assumptions, not because of our technical prowess. And I saw Lee Worden on here, he helped with that technical prowess. Um, the, what I think is the problem is this whole idea of, of and that's, Sharon Schwartz article goes into it, the whole idea of like well-defined variables. So it's easy to model well-defined variables, but when you get into reparations, it's really, you're really talking about some upstream structural stuff that is hard to well-define. And because you can't define it, it doesn't get included in the models and then is almost is not thought of as uh, you know, being pertinent. This is my problem with causal inference that you really can't do radical stuff with it. To me, it's all about uh, conservative interpretations. So my suggestion is that, you know, rather than think of what we're doing as science, because we're never going to, the you know, causal inference does fall in the scientific realm. Since we can't get into that paradigm, 
um, it's okay to see what we're doing as humanist and interpretive and curative, you know, and curating, because that's how everybody else interprets the world. Um, it's just about finding ways uh, that don't have to fit normal science, that actually are more just descriptions, that actually increase equity. That's the whole anti-racism argument. It's not about, are you doing something that affects one race and the other? It's, it's about equity. So affirmative action is okay, even though it's anti-white because it achieves equity. Um, and what I think when I read most of the, the work out there is that there isn't an, equ an equity agenda behind it because in this case, I think downstream analyses um, gut that possibility. Let me um, read now some of the questions that are coming. Uh, this is coming from Dr. Eric Goosby, um, who, as you know, uh, was um, um, head of uh, PEPFAR in the Obama administration. Um, he asked uh, the following, I think your work opens up new areas of understanding and challenge for those of us working in global health. I would be interested in your thoughts on where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile taking care of an unmet need in a country in clinical work often diminishes the response from the country and dilutes the population's ability to hold the government accountable. And uh, I guess a follow-up question, this is from me, not from Eric. Um, do you think um, PEPFAR work in, in Africa is uh, imperialistic? Um, there are other questions from um, people. Let me read it now. and go back to Jane later. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, is it truly racist to acknowledge that blacks have significant comorbidities as a result of the structural determinants stacked against them? So why don't we start with those and then go back to other questions? Okay, as far as, yeah, PEPFAR being imperialist, uh, no, you know, I think it was one of the best examples of uh, transitional justice, you know, saved tens of millions of lives was a fantastic endeavor. What I worry, though, is that it, it was not used as a form of transitional justice. It was used as a continuing form of aid. I mean, Lindsay, I saw a video of Lindsey Graham saying PEPFAR was the best reducer of, like, um, what did he say? You know, not ISIS people, but like people, a, a way of like preventing countries from totally disintegrating because they had everybody dying and those people flying off to join counter West movements. Um, to me, that sums it up pretty well that we still implement it more as, as a neo-colonial strategy than one of transitional justice. If it could have been used as a 50 year plan while reparations were being uh, developed, to me, that would have made the most sense. Um, and I think that gets to you know, Eric's other question, what can we do? I, you know, I've become a firm uh, proponent of you know, going past, so let's look at it this way. You know, in the 1800s, you had uh, the anti-slavery movements that was kind of the, you know, cute, uh, consciousness of the time. And in the 1900s, you had the human rights movements. Um, and now maybe in the, you know, 2000s, the 2100s, the, that reparations becomes sort of the, the next paradigm for, for achieving uh, equality. So, you know, if you ask me, well, how, how should we set up, you know, vaccine distribution and, um, and Ebola tests and this and this and that in a DRC, I would say, get three trillion from uh, Belgium and another one or two from the US uh, for, we can go into the reasons. And I don't think you have to answer those questions. Um, and that's what our, you know, they, the, the resources, um, which would be less than what had been stolen. I mean, by some calculations, UK stole 45 trillion from India. So to me, it's a huge deal that, that people are working off of 
what was stolen from them and then having to like, you know, accept the crumbs that come back. Uh, and I know it sounds like it's a, uh, a massive radical change to try and demand these things, but my argument is that it sounds that way because it's, because it's like pushed out of how we've even been trained to think. Um, as far as the comorbidity thing, no, I don't think it's, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. If, if that were the case that uh, it was comorbidities, then yes, uh, institutional racism has led to those. But the fact is that it's much uh, more exposure risk, which then becomes like not, you know, because people can tie this personal choice stuff into whether a person's obese or diabetic. You're not going to tie uh, the personal choice into whether somebody lives three to a room um, and, uh, you know, in ghetto conditions. And so it makes it much more, it makes you able to see it more uh, structurally. And, and, and it's even, to me, it's even worse than that, than like our, right, our Corona task force is talking nothing about those type of deep interventions when really, you know, uh, it's just status quo, mask, social, uh, social distance. None of this stuff we even learned ourselves. All you had to do was watch what happened in China, Japan, they social distance, they put on masks, contained it, went to Italy, they didn't, it, it blew up. Now you know what to do. You don't need, you don't need models. You don't need new Twitter stars telling you to wear masks. Because um, all they're doing is, oh, that's what health experts are focusing on, that we should wear masks. Where are the health experts that are focusing on the reparations? They're not getting funding is, is where they are. So that's that. <laughs> well, thank you. And Jaime, I know um, there are a number of questions in the chat. I thought I could follow up um, with one from Iqua. Um, what are your thoughts on how during the crisis and the health crisis that hurt people of color most, such as the current pandemic, um, it is predominantly white researchers who get to access uh, the resources and money uh, for research and become the face and leaders of the response due to the racist inequities in academic personnel and research funding? Yes. Um, so another great question. I mean, I've thought about these things for years and I don't want to keep coming back to the uh, you know, reparations thing as a, a panacea, but because it's not, I'm more of like a convener of the, of the groups that are, uh, that are publishing each of the sections in our, in our report. But the, the people working on uh, descendants of, of uh, black persons enslaved in the US would say, they've gotten to the point where it's almost just a check they want delivered because they feel that once you destroy the wealth gap, you know, and allow, um, you know, uh, the next generation to inherit, um, that people actually have, uh, are able to afford like, you know, legal counsel and protection. Um, they're able to, you know, be, be in places with better schools. All these things, it's almost like a trickle down, <laughs> will, will lead to uh, uh, situations where there is equity in, you know, the different professions. I mean, that, that, that would be the hope. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we're going to get there by another, um, you know, diversity officer at the school, you know, prioritizing, uh, um, uh, you know, first author this and first author that. That I think is a, what I talked about with uh, Tolstoy, it is a representation of the American collective will that, that there be, uh, um, you know, the, the racist holding down of non-whites. And I've come to firmly agree with my colleagues that the only way to fix that is repairing the legacies Re and repair is reparations. <laughs> We're going to get uh, near the end. Um, there is um, a provocative comment by an anonymous attendee no disrespect intended, but it is difficult to listen to you, a white man who works for Harvard Medical School, throw around accusations like this. You fail to acknowledge your own privilege and your own perpetuation of coloniality. What colonialist behavior or research will you admit to engaging in yourself? Yeah, no, that is a great question. Let me just read the first, uh, 
I'll read you the first paragraph of the book. Maybe I should have started with this. Um, that one, I, um, uh, you know, I'm not, rep I, I don't claim to be representing, uh, you know, oppressed classes. I just claim to be someone who's able to observe how harmers do their harm, like how people in privileged positions like me do their harm. And so it's more of a, you know, I'm reporting on how my group uh, does its harm. Uh, but my, the first, let's see, in the intro I say, So my ideas on the coloniality of global health come from engagements as a privilege exerciser, that is a white upper middle class male settler colonist in the global south and it's spigots in the global north. Uh, basically spigots is where all the money comes out in places like New York. Um, through various guises of physician, anthropologist, researcher, consultant, intern, uh, I've struggled to understand the causes of epidemics lying in the care uh, for people uh, affected by them. So, I mean, I list my positionality and I don't claim to represent uh, um, the oppressed classes. Uh, you know, what some colleagues have said is, uh, you know, the, you, you should use this as an example to weaponize your privilege. Uh, you know, I don't know that I'm doing that either, but I think in the book I lay out, uh, you know, I totally agree where what my position is, why I'm, um, you know, why I'm in a, place to be giving this talk today, but also that I'm not here to represent the, the what the forces look like when they're received, but I am privy to what the forces look like when they go out. And so I think it's worthwhile to make, to put that description out there. All right, um, we, we will need to, to close uh, soon. Um, I think uh, Gene, um, where I disagree with you, and uh, we talked about that later, having been a part of the leadership at the Gates Foundation, having worked with Bill Gates closely, um, having known IHME closely as uh, executive sponsor, I think some of the um, adjectives used are too strong, unfair, and biased. Um, I think Tony Fauci, is one of the great public health heroes in this country. And um, to call him an ideologue is too strong. Um, IHME run by Chris Murray, Julio Frank is the chair of the board, uh, calling the work of IHME racist uh, is uh, certainly something I would strongly dispute. So just for the record, I think it's uh, okay to agree to disagree. And uh, I think uh, this kind of uh, conversations is what we need to have in, in global health. And uh, the fact that we had um, 182 participants uh, staying with us up to this time and just looking at the tremendous amounts of uh, comments and questions from the public um, is uh, a reassurance that this is a, a very um, actual topic. I just see one question. We have one minute uh, from Sir Richard Fitchen. Surely the flow of roughly 40 billion per year of health sector aid funds from wealthy, mainly white countries to much poorer, mainly black countries, is a structural underpinning of coloniality in global health. It warranties that decisions about what is best for Malawi continue to be made in Geneva, Washington, and London. And I strongly agree with that statement. Uh, I think, um, uh, that is something to reflect very, very carefully where the decisions in global health are made and who funds those decisions. But um, I think this is a topic for um, a continuing conversation. Dr. Richardson, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you so much. Goodbye, and everyone. For those we couldn't answer, feel free to send me an email. Um, but I appreciate your joining us today. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye, everyone.